to me and Jeff, and then we, we carry on and everyone leaves. I'll stop talking. It's only 11.15. I could start having some wine, though. I want me to catch up with your hangover. It's not 11 uh, anything. We're live, by the way, just so you know. <clears throat> we have our reputations to protect, Mustafa. True, true. I don't think we do. I'm so used to Zoom from teaching. It's my native land now. All right, I think we're just going to wait a couple of minutes for people to stream in, and then we're going to get going. <laughs> All right, I think we can get started. People will just stream in. So hi everyone, thank you for joining us today on hopefully a fantastic session. So this session is a little bit different. It's a panel session and you can hopefully ask a lot of questions from Dr. Wild and Dr. Carol. And let's basically get it going. Any questions to start off with? Ed and Jeff, do you guys wanna introduce yourself? I mean, I'm pretty sure you guys don't need any any introduction from me. So that's good going. Well, I'm, I'm happy to introduce myself and, and make the important point that it's actually Professor Wilde and Dr. Oh, Carol. So, I'm so sorry. But, um, you know, Wilde. it's not a big deal. Is yeah. but, you know, it's, yeah, we yeah. wouldn't want any misunderstandings sure, to arise. Sure, sure. Did you Associate just say that Professor so you can get a one up right? on Jeff? Or is it more like, <laughs> yeah. of course, you got to get your jabs in early in, a, in yeah. an encounter of this kind. Yeah. <laughs> It's establishing dominance. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, if you're on the call and you don't know me, uh, I'm Jeff Carroll. That's all you're and getting out of me. I'm Ed. I'm, uh, so I'm in London and Jeff's in uh, uh, Washington State, West Coast. So I'm um, a clinician and uh, so I'm a neurologist and I, uh, I'm a researcher running clinical trials and doing research into biomarkers and all of that other stuff. So I was involved, very involved in Huntington lowering um, trials like the uh, Rush uh, Ionis project. And uh, Jeff and I both set up HD Buzz together. You probably know all of that stuff. Jeff, what, what, um, someone's asking what, what we're both working. Oh, Jacqueline is asking what we're both working on now. Well, that's quite a good way to start. Uh, yeah, uh, so hi everybody. Uh, I guess on a more serious note, I'm Jeff Carroll. Uh, I'm not a physician, I'm a basic scientist. Uh, I work primarily on mouse models of HD, trying to understand uh, the sort of process of how cells in the brain dysfunction thanks to HD mutation. Um, so my lab right now is working a lot on the impacts of Huntington lowering and trying to understand the normal roles of the Huntington protein within cells. Um, and if I keep talking about that, I'll bore everyone off the call. So I will shut up about my own work, but it's um, willing to talk as much as you guys will listen. Um, and so I have to say that um, in answer to Jacqueline's question about what I'm working on now, um, my personal uh, nine to five since Christmas Eve has been COVID vaccinations. Um, I uh, had the opportunity to help open up the COVID vaccine clinic in my hospital so I could help vaccinate the frontline staff that were dealing with the latest wave of the pandemic. I'm not sure if it's a second or third wave, but it was really bad. Um, so, um, but just in the nick of time, we got a big supply of the Pfizer COVID vaccine. And so we, I was vaccinating with that. And, and since New Year, I've been helping to open up new vaccine centers, uh, one of which was in a scientific institute down the road. And one was, um, uh, we opened this week, which is going to be uh, vaccinating 4,000 people a week. So I've been doing a lot of that. And uh, I, you know, so we'll, we'll talk about vaccines since it was someone else has asked about that already. But um, I've been doing a lot of that, but my, my research carries on. And so we're, we're continuing um, for instance, collecting CSF from patients in the HD Clarity study. CSF is cerebrospinal fluid, which is the fluid that the brain produces 
that kind of bathes the brain and spinal cord. And um, in the HD clarity study, we collect that fluid from HD patients and, and uh, at risk uh, family members and, and healthy controls at lots of sites around the world. And um, we use that to study and understand HD and, and it helps us to design and run uh, drug trials. So that is, and the good thing about that is it's at so many sites that wherever individual countries are in the pandemic, we can either be helping them to collect CSF or we can be helping them to restart um, uh, their uh, projects. And that kind of slightly reflects what's been happening more broadly across HD, which is really that, um, you know, we're more or less a year into this pandemic now. And um, it's been a very disrupted year for research. Uh, you know, lots of, lots of projects that were going to start didn't, and lots of projects involving humans uh, and actually, you know, lab stuff. Um, had to get put on hold or, or even cancelled. However, the enthusiasm of the HD community, research community is, is undimmed. And, you know, we've, we, we've spent a lot of effort keeping our, our studies running as much as we possibly can. So for instance, at our site in London, and this is the same in many sites in the UK, um, patients who were already in drug trials and had, who had already been sort of randomised and were receiving treatment were able to actually carry on receiving those uh, treatments and having some in-person visits. Some visits were converted to video and phone. Um, and, uh, you know, in the in the little gap we had in sort of September, October, we were actually able to roll a few people, a few more people into active treatment. Um, and actually the, 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 the rush, the big rush Huntington lowering study, uh, the phase three trial of Tommy Nursen ended up being fully recruited two months into the pandemic, which is just phenomenal. And like the, um, the uh, Unicure uh, trial, which is a gene therapy trial involving neurosurgery, um, still managed to get up and running and has, has been enrolling and treating patients. And those patients have been undergoing regular review. So um, it's been a weird old year, um, but my research team has been phenomenal. They've all their lives are very different, but we've been able to produce quite a lot of papers and you know, carry on doing research uh, and um, the dedication of everyone involved has just been phenomenal. So as a long answer to your question, Jacqueline. <laughs> Yeah, and I think when when I first heard about the lockdown, I was I was you know my first thought besides the obvious was about HD research and particularly HD clinical research, and I was just terrified that everything would get shut down. And I was thinking particularly about the Roche study, you know, because it had just sort of just started and you know gotten filled up, um, and 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 the fact that it's been able to continue on has been one of the real real high points for me. I'm just so impressed. And other studies like Triplet started their observational study in the middle of the pandemic and not only launched it, but filled it up with people uh, largely in Canada, but also in the US. Um, so just real incredible um, effort on everyone's behalf. Yeah. Um, should we take another aspect of that, the questions that are there, Ed? Yeah, so I start with, you can do Tina's question too. Hi, Tina, thanks for your question. Um, if, you, if you wanna ask questions, guys, it's, uh, it, please do it in the Q&A box. If you can't figure that out, and I've never used that, um, please, you can just put them in the chat. We'll, we'll keep an eye on both. So Tina's asking, um, does, uh, oh, I'm just gonna, there we go. Does the development of mRNA vaccines for COVID benefit HD research in any way? That's a complicated question because some people may not know what mRNA is or what an mRNA vaccine is or what that's got to do with um, HD. So um, let's go back to uh, high school biology. Your cells contain DNA, and that's a set of instructions for building a person. Um, and uh, if you put enough DNA together, uh, it's a recipe for a protein. And a protein is a, is a, uh, a cellular machine. So it's a machine that will do something. Um, so like insulin is a protein. Um, I can never, I always start listing these proteins and I can't think of any others. Jeff, if you think of any other proteins, <laughs> let me know. Huntington, oh, that's one. Huntington is a protein. Um, and um, so, but the, the DNA in your genes is like a really, it's almost literally a, a kind of family heirloom recipe book that's been passed from one generation to the next. So that's not the book that you take into the kitchen and get dirty. If you want to make one of your grandma's recipes, uh, you're going to, sure, I used to say, I used to be, are you all right there, Jeffrey? Did you think you were me? Sorry. Too? No, I was uh, I, I was on the way to the mute button. I was trying to whiteboard out what you were talking about, but I'm not artistic enough to do it, so I stopped trying. 
Were you silent or were you silenced, as Oprah said to um, Harry and Meghan? <laughs> anyway, where was I? <laughs> um, what we took, oh yeah. So if you're gonna take, if you wanna do a recipe from your grandmother's recipe book, uh, you're gonna take a photo of it on your mobile phone and, or cell phone and take it into the kitchen. And that, that photo of the recipe is kind of like what mRNA is, it's messenger RNA. So it's kind of like a copy of the original set of instructions. And it, it, it's written in a different format, but it contains the same information. Um, and, and so um, the, the weird thing about the whole COVID and the vaccine situation is that two of the licensed vaccines, the one from Pfizer and the one from Moderna, are both based on this mRNA technology. And, but Jeff and I have been talking about mRNA for nearly 20 years because mRNA is also fundamental to how we are trying to, how the world is trying to treat Huntington's disease. So the problem in Huntington's disease is that the DNA that's a recipe for this protein called Huntington, which is important for our brains, is slightly different. That DNA is copied into mRNA and that mRNA is then used as a set of instructions for making the Huntington protein. And the, the drugs that we've been testing that we call Huntington lowering drugs, what they're trying to do is reduce production of that protein, Huntington, but they do it by targeting the mRNA. And actually the drug is made from a little bit of synthetic DNA, which is made by a machine very like a laser printer. And that drug DNA molecule sticks to the RNA and they kind of cancel each other out and the protein doesn't get made. So we're using DNA drugs to treat Huntington's disease. And lo and behold, the first vaccine that comes along is a vaccine made from mRNA. It's actually wrapped in lipid, little lipid nanoparticles. But what you, what you could say is that, and that, that Pfizer vaccine, by the way, is incredibly safe and effective. It works really well. Um, and what it's actually doing, because RNA is a set of instructions, that, that um, RNA, you inject it into your arm, it, it diffuses, it kind of dissolves into the muscles of your muscle cells of your arm. And then for a few days, it kind of hijacks your arm muscles, uh, protein manufacturing factory, and turns your muscle into a factory for making the spike protein from the COVID virus, the coronavirus. So you know that like, this, this is a real orange, right? <laughs> but when you see the COVID virus on TV, um, it might be a satsuma. When you see the real virus on TV, it has all of these spikes sticking out of it. And that's why it's called coronavirus because it looks like a crown. Anyway, the spikes that stick out are like a, a switchblade knife that the virus uses to get into your cells. Um, but it's really, uh, it turns out that that's a really easy thing for your immune system to attack. Um, and so all of the vaccines that are being um, given basically are based on the spike protein. And so the, the Pfizer vaccine uses RNA to trick your muscle cells into making the spike protein. And that, can't, that doesn't cause disease and it can't cause COVID, but it's enough for your immune system to learn what COVID, the coronavirus looks like. And then when it encounters, and it, so it sort of puts together a kind of uh, laser seeking set of defenses. And um, then when it meets the real virus, it's very quick and easy for it to get rid of it, which is why it, you know the, the Pfizer vaccine prevents 95% of infections and 90% of deaths. Or, or rather 90% of hospitalizations. So um, uh, long story short, the, really? the, the whole, <laughs> no, all right, long story long, but hey, <laughs> it's science, it's very cool science. Basically this whole field, you could think of it as nucleotide therapeutics. The nucleotide is a name given to all of this family of um, structures like DNA and RNA that can be used to basically store instructions. So those are nucleotides. And our Huntington lowering drug, well, it was developed by Ionis, now it's owned by Roche. That drug is, an, is a nucleotide therapeutic. And the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are also nucleotide therapeutics that are vaccines. Um, so weirdly, uh, you know, five years ago, almost, uh, exactly i gave the first dose of this dna based drug into the spine of a huntington's disease patient and now we're giving doses of an rna based vaccine into the arm of 
members of the public and healthcare workers uh, in order to protect them against COVID. So the question was, does the development of these vaccines benefit HD research? I, I, not, I mean, directly, yes, because it's keeping patients alive and it's keeping uh, members of the public alive and it's keeping scientific researchers and neurologists and everyone else alive. These vaccines are the only way out of this pandemic and they are a great big open door out of the pandemic as long as we all push on that door um, and walk through it together. Um, so yes, in, 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 no, in no uncertain terms, the vaccine program as a whole is how we, how we get back to everyone being safe to be out in public and be at work. And that's how we will you know, go back to 100% on our, um, uh, on our HD research trajectory. Um, but this whole, um, the, uh, you know, getting uh, these vaccines licensed and you know, the amount of science that's been poured into the technologies to deliver them and manufacture them, that's all stuff that will really uh, help this whole field in Huntington's disease where we're actually using DNA and RNA and other similar approaches to actually kind of up, up uh, turn up or turn down the production of proteins in the brain. So yes. Yeah, not, I would say that like there's one other way too, which is maybe um, less obvious to folks, but you know, one of the things that's been happening behind the scenes with the coronavirus research is there's been this incredible um, upwelling of, of what we call open science, which is to say that like traditionally people, whether they're doing vaccines or whether they're doing HD research, they finish their research, they, you know, dot all their I's and cross all their T's, wrap it up into a nice little paper, and then submit that and publish it. Um, and that takes months and sometimes years to get through review, and it can be a long time before other people see the results. And that just wasn't fast enough during the pandemic. And so there's been the rise of what's called preprints and other ways of accessing data early um, that I think have will hopefully become more habitual for people in science. And it lowered the bar for scientists to start sharing data early. So I think you know the need to have research happen fast during the pandemic hopefully will inspire and the rest of us working in other fields to keep doing that kind of early sharing. Um, and I, I see signs of that already. I mean, so many people in HD field now, as soon as their research is done, They'll, they'll put it out on the internet on what's called a preprint server so people can can read it and see it while it's being reviewed and checked and all that stuff. Um, so I think this push towards open science is another unexpected outcome that's gonna be really good for, for HD folks. I can confirm um, that that's true because I this past year, my team started using preprints for the first time. I, I'd always been a bit skeptical about that, that option of putting your research out on basically a website before it's actually been peer reviewed and published. Um, but um, seeing the degree to which that was accelerating research in, into COVID was one of the things that inspired us to, to start doing it. And, and we've had really great experiences and, and you get some really great feedback on the work before you actually uh, end up having to submit it for, for your anonymous colleagues to tear it to shreds. <laughs> um, Tina had a second part to that question, which was how big is the HD research community? It's a fun question. I've been thinking about it. I'm not sure, I guess, you know, um, there's probably, what would you say, several thousand researchers who work primarily or solely on HD um, spread across, um, you know, important nonprofit entities like, like CHDI Foundation, academic researchers like Ed and I, um, people at pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies. Um, but there's also like many, many thousands of people that work in sort of adjacent kind of technologies, um, things like nucleotide drugs, like Ed was talking about. Um, whose work isn't necessarily on HD, but whose work helps us. And so it's really hard to sort of untangle the silo of people who like quote work on HD because there's a few thousand of us around the world probably that do that all day, every day. But there's also, you know, hundreds of thousands of scientists collectively working that are building this body of technology that we draw from. Sorry, yeah, that's a non-answer question to your question, Tina. It's certainly bigger than it was, even since I've been in the field. But, you know, obviously in the early 90s, uh, the gene was discovered and that was a big effort. But but no, having that gene identified is something that's actually really attractive to people who are trying to figure out what what to do with their research careers. Um, because, you know, you can um, you, you can use that gene as a starting point and it makes the disease one that you feel going into it, you feel like it's a solvable problem, Huntington's disease. Uh, and we haven't solved it yet, but we do still think that it is a solvable problem. And we do still know for sure what the problem is that we need to fix, which is that this gene that's passed down is making your cells 
you know, harm themselves. And um, that there's a very straightforward chain of uh, events that takes place. It, it gets complicated pretty quickly, um, but HD is a very attractive field. And actually the amount of progress that we've seen, and uh, you know, it's easy for scientists to say, oh, we're really close, we're closer than we were, we're seeing progress. Um, but you know, we, in 2015, we, we started out wanting to lower the concentration of this Huntington protein. And in 2017, we announced that we had done it. And now we're running a big phase three trial to figure out whether lowering the concentration of the protein in the brain that slows the progression of the disease. And if it does, that's brilliant. Uh, and we should find out more or less this time next year or a little bit sort of probably mid 2022 uh, is when we should find out where, whether that drug is working. If it is, brilliant, it's a foot in the door, but we won't stop trying to develop better drugs. If it's not, um, we'll try and figure out why, um, but we already have multiple other drugs doing something similar or doing you know, very cool, like fundamental things. And every time a new drug company gets into HD, I would estimate that it probably adds, uh, uh, let me put like a figure out of thin air, about a thousand people to the pool of HD, of people whose full-time job is Huntington's disease. Um, because, you know, a new drug in a drug company and setting up a trial, it takes such a big infrastructure that over, more or less overnight or in the space of two or three months, a thousand people will, will suddenly find that their full-time job or, or a significant part of their job is working on Huntington's disease. So um, yeah, it's a bit of a growth uh, industry. Um, but we haven't really given an answer. I would say people whose full-time research job is Huntington's disease is probably about 4,000 4, 4, people in the world. Plus our uh, but people who work on Huntington's disease, we've all got cute dog, Jeff. <laughs> uh, people who work on Huntington's disease to some extent must be probably 30,000. Yeah. Just well, and I, uh, I'll just, uh, just the thing about the community and then I'll shut up. Um, I think, you know, when I first started in HD research, we felt, I felt um, always a little jealous of like the quote unquote more common diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's um, because I thought, that, oh, if we had the resources they had or, you know, the numbers of patients, which lets us do all these the science faster, we'd be so lucky. But actually, I think, you know, I think people in those diseases now come to HD meetings. They're like, God, I wish we had your guys as both the community of the patients and family that um, I've been so supportive, the community of researchers, some of whom have been working in the field, you know, for decades and continue to work on it and, and the amazing resources that are being spent now on it. Um, it really feels very different when you go to these conferences and other people from other brain disease fields come to HD meetings and they're like, oh my God, I'm so jealous. This is such a great community and you guys are working mm -hmm. so fast. Um, so that's been a huge change um, in the last 10 years or so. One other thing Should to we say while we're talking oh, sorry, about, yeah. well, just one final thing while we're talking about numbers and size of the community is that HD is a pretty rare disease. But when you look at how much money is public money and private money and philanthropic money, charity money, has been spent on HD over the past 20 years. Um, it's, it, it's way more than you would expect, given how rare HD is. And a big driver of that has been CHDI Foundation. So if you don't know what CHDI is, it's a research foundation based in the USA that's funded by uh, generous donations by private individuals. Um, and it spends about as much on Huntington's disease as, for instance, Britain spends on cancer research. And probably not quite that much, but it's close. Um, so it's an absolutely huge investment of money, but it's not just money. They're, they're kind of or re, so really kind of organizing and coordinating and directly carrying out, contributing to research across the world. And having, a, having an, org, an, an organization of that resources and that amount of um, ability uh, it has has really been transformative it's been it's been it's, it's been a, a kind of a, a behind the scenes catalyst to many many of the things that are now coming to fruition in hd research so there's a Let's couple take, questions I, ed that go ahead oh, sorry go yeah. ahead now you go i'm english you go first there's a few questions that all center around um, well there's there's kind of two aspects one is the wild type only versus pan huntington lowering which i can take and then there are a few questions about when readouts would be expected from the anti-sense trials or the ongoing lowering trials generally yeah. so i'll let maybe you take that so i'll start with them um, yeah so the the question is so every everyone or almost every human on earth has two huntington genes um, and uh, the vast vast majority of huntington patients 
uh, have only one mutant copy of the gene. So you don't, it's not like a disease. Um, oh God, I literally can't think of a recessive disease right now because you guys are all staring at me. It's not like a disease where you need to inherit two mutant copies to have the disease, one from your mom and one from your dad. You only, all, all HD patients basically have one bad copy. So in theory, um, the, the sort of perfect idea to, to fix HD would be to just, just lower or reduce levels of the mutant gene or its product. Um, and there are ways to do that. They're trickier and technically more demanding. Um, and we're lucky in HD because the roche ionis trial that Ed mentioned, which we'll talk about the timing of in just a second, um, is a large, you know, 800 person study focused on, on lower, not silencing completely, but lowering levels of total Huntington. So both the normal copy and the mutant copy. Um, and lots of animal work suggests that the lowering levels that are being targeted is safe. Uh, we've done all the animal work we could. And clearly there's been a lot of people on those drugs for a long time. And if, if there were a really adverse event, we would have known by now because they would have halted the trial. It's being independently monitored by physicians uh, who have nothing to do with the trial. So clearly if there was like an immediate, you know, negative response to, the, to that kind of lowering, we would sort of know by now based on how many people have been taking those drugs and how long they've been taking it. But the other thing is that there are other companies in this space. So Wave Life Sciences is running currently two, but I think soon three trials focused on doing, a, it's called allele selective in the lingo. And it basically means using an ASO that only lowers the mutant Huntington or preferentially lowers mutant Huntington, but not wild type Huntington. And so uh, not normal Huntington. And so those drugs in theory spare the normal copy. So if it turns out that that's necessary or preferential from like a toxicity point of view, those trials are already happening. Uh, and they're not in the phase three study, which is the last stage study that you do with lots and lots of people. They're in an earlier stage study where they're doing in a relatively smaller number of people um, testing whether the drugs can lower a mutant Huntington. And actually, I think we expect results from WAVE in the first quarter of this year, which is uh, only a few more weeks. So we won't have large doesn't make HD better data from WAVE there at an earlier stage, but we'll have that really important, does, honey, does mutant Huntington get lowered by waves ASO approach in the next weeks or months, um, I, would, I would hope. Um, yeah, Ed. So why don't we just like, if mutant Huntington is bad and wild type Huntington is good, why don't we just, why are we bothering to the, with the approach that just lowers both? Why don't we just, low, just go straight in and lower the bad one? Because it's just hard. <laughs> it's really challenging. The, the way ASOs work so far, we can't target the mutation that causes HD itself. So you have to do these kind of like more elaborate approaches where you're targeting a little genetic variant somewhere else in the RNA that's not actually the gene that causes the mutation that causes HD. And so not every HD patient will have that other second variant that you need to target. And so um, you're splitting your population, right? So it's so the Ionis Roche study, everyone, everyone who has HD can can be in that study, or you know, in theory. These wave right. studies in, intentionally only target a sub part of the population and it will never be a hundred percent, but it will always, you know, start to approach a large number if all these drugs work, but it, it will never be a hundred percent. So the, the, the answer is that, which I did know, is that, <laughs> just FYI, is that um, only by targeting both can you get a drug, one drug that works for everyone at the moment, although we are working on that. Yeah. Cool. Yep. Okay. Um, and like, um, is it going to be bad to to silence wild type Huntington? Wild type is what we call the you know the the kind of natural or healthy or normal Huntington, whatever you however you want. To, it's not named after me, although it easily could have been. Um, so um, you know, uh, what what do you think, Jeff? You're you're a, a lab scientist and you work with Huntington. Do you think it's do you think it's bad to lower wild type Huntington? You know. It's probably a lot worse than Huntington's disease, um, whatever it is. So, you know, and, and, and this has been a Wait, question. Did you that say we... it's worse than Huntington's disease? Sorry, it's not worse than Huntington's Thank disease. Thank you. I thought you said a lot worse. <laughs> no, it's not worse. Okay. So, good. you know, it's, we have to remember that this baseline is not like we're going into perfectly healthy people, right? And like we're trying to stop a horrible disease. So it's like it's always about a balance of risks. And, and they, you know, we've done pretty significant animal studies with Huntington lowering that are um, well tolerated, even in large animals like non-human primates. Um, you know, so scientists like myself are curious about what wild type Huntington does. It honestly just bugs me that we don't know what this gene mm. does, however many years after we studied it. So that's, I, I just go to work every day because it just irritates me that we don't know what this gene does. 
And we've made all kinds of mice that don't have any Huntington and different kinds of cells that are body. And there are differences in the way those cells work. And that's what we're studying. But overall, as long as you're through development. So brain development is a time when the brain is being, um, obviously, you know, when you're in utero and you're actually developing as an embryo, your brain develops. But your brain continues to develop through your young adult life. And it's not really fully kind of wired until like, say, your early 20s or so. And we think yeah. that period of brain development and potentially all the way up through that latter period of brain development is a time when you probably don't want to lower Huntington, total Huntington levels, because we know Huntington plays important roles during that developmental phase. Um, but the brain is quite different in development than it is in adulthood. And as far as we can yeah. tell so far, it's been, re it's relatively safe. To and we think the there are people like, we think there are people walking around who were only born with one copy of the Huntington gene or one regular. There copy, are. Right? Yeah. And they don't themselves seem to have any kind of brain disease and so that but what oh. that's basically is essentially a, a, a natural experiment into what happens if you have 50 percent of the normal amount of Huntington or probably so is. 50, 50 so percent of Huntington is, is perfectly fine as far as we know because there's like you said those folks are walking around yeah um, and and so just them. to get specific about the, the the Roche trial which is the jet the phase three generation HD1 trial that, that I was talking about that was recruited last year and that we'll read out next year. So um, the, the previous trial that reported in 2017 tested five different doses from 10 milligrams up, all the way up to 120 milligrams. And those doses were given once a month. And because the 120 milligram dose was well tolerated, that was the dose that was taken into the phase three trial. But two different dosing regimes are being used for that um, in the actual trial. There's one that's that's where the drug is given every two months and one where the drug is given every four months. And obviously if you give it more often, you get a more dramatic squashing of the Huntington production. So let, just to pull numbers out of the air, let's say maybe the two monthly dose reduces your Huntington level by 60% and maybe the four monthly reduces it by 30%. And it's, it's probably gonna reduce the mutant and the wild type level roughly equally. Um, so in the, you know, in the process of this trial, we'll figure out whether, um, for instance, is 30% reduction in mutant Huntington enough or is, do we need 50%? And if we need to do 50%, is that too much reduction in wild type? Do we then need to sort of try another dose and step back to like 40% or do we maybe need to try a lower dose given more often and, and you really kind of tailor it to how much normal healthy Huntington the brain needs and also how much we need to reduce the mutant Huntington. Um, so it, it's a sort of, you know, and all of these trials are an experiment, but the good thing about these ASO and these DNA based drugs that we're injecting into the spine is it's kind of like a volume control, right? It's not an on off switch, it's a volume control. So if we want to lower more, we can give more. If we want to lower less, we can give less. If we think we've gone too far, we stop the drug. And within a couple of weeks, the drug or a month or so, the drug is gone from the, um, from the system. Um, you know, so that's like, uh, that's the, the, the sort of the upside of, of these uh, Huntington lowering drugs. Now, the next generation of drugs will probably be what we call gene therapies, which is a little bit like the AstraZeneca COVID vaccine, where you basically, you take the, you, you know, one way or another, it's about getting a new set of instructions into the human body. And one way you can do that is by using the amazing power of viruses to get into the body, which, we, which we've seen over the past year. Um, uh, and you know, in the AstraZeneca vaccine, the Oxford vaccine, uh, which I had in the Oxford trial, um, was is a virus, a harmless virus that contains instructions for vaccinating you against COVID. Um, Unicure is doing a, is doing a, a viral. Uh, brain treatment for Huntington's disease um, and you know so that's that's uh, that involves neurosurgery and injecting a virus into the brain but that virus then turns the brain into a factory for making a substance that then lowers production of Huntington it's a bit more complicated but that's a one-off that is more like a kind of on-off switch or rather it's a permanent uh, mute button um, which you would which will hopefully only need to be given once um, and you know so that that that's being tested and and later this year we, we expect um, the big drug company Novartis to, to launch a new trial of a drug called Branaplan, um, which is already um, uh, being used to treat spinal muscular atrophy, which is a, a disease of children, brain, a brain and spine disease of children. So, um, and it turned out sort of by accident, they discovered that this Branaplan drug is actually lowering Huntington levels in the, in the cells. 
um, when it's given to uh, these uh, kids with this other disease. So we're actually going to start testing that in Huntington's disease later this year. So that's a kind of oral pill form um, Huntington lowering drug, which is pretty cool. Which is um, bonkers, actually. Like, if you had told me that there were a drug that you could take as a pill that lowered the RNA of a specific gene, I would have told you you were on drugs. But um, here we are. Not all drugs are bad, it seems. Um, well, how did that question start? That was about wild type mutant Huntington. Um, so that's good. Hated. Somebody asked a, a follow up timing question that maybe you can handle too, Ed, but about like, okay, let's say a, a phase three study is successful. Let's say the Roche Ionis one, if, if we want to be like yeah. optimistic and excited, how long after, what happens next? Like from the end of right. a phase yeah, three yeah, study, yeah. what's okay. the process to actually getting to people? Right, it's a perfectly understandable question. And, and the best example we have is, is, is from this other disease, again, called um, a Browner plan. Uh, no, called, sorry, the disease is called spinal muscular atrophy. And the first drug uh, to be licensed for that disease was called Spinraza or Nusinersen. And that's another um, DNA-based drug injected into the spine. So very similar technologically to the drug that we're testing in HD. The phase three trial of that disease um, was stopped early because the, the children in, who were on the active drug were, um, were doing so much better than the kids who were on placebo that, 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 that they, they had to stop the trial because it was clear that the drug was working. And I think it took about two months from the result of that trial to the FDA licensing the drug. The FDA is the American Drug Regulatory Agency. So they're the ones who basically say yes or no whether doctors can prescribe the drug. Um, and so that drug was licensed so quickly. Um, now, Huntington's disease is more difficult to test drugs because it's much slower and it looks very different from one person to another. So it's just much more difficult. And so we, you know, we, we don't expect our phase three trial to read out early. Uh, we expect it to read out mid next year. If the if the trial is positive, um, you Roche is has been in this position many times before. They've developed lots of drugs. They know how to file a regulatory approval, and as soon as the results positive, they'll hit go on that, and those filings will go in. And um, you know, it, it depends. I guess to a some extent, it depends where we are with COVID. But I would expect that by this time next year, the regulatory agencies won't be won't be all tied up with COVID anymore. Um, and it, so I would think it would probably take around six months to get the drug, I don't know, maybe four to six months to get the drug licensed if the data clearly show it works. But tr once it's licensed in any country, doctors can prescribe it, but the real issue, well, uh, the next challenge will be who pays for it. For instance, in the UK or in Canada, will the um, government healthcare providers pay for it? In the USA, will the insurance providers pay for it? Um, it seems very likely to me that they will because for all of, to all of those people, Huntington's disease is already quite an expensive condition to have to deal with. So a drug, even if the drug is expensive, if it reduces healthcare costs in the long term, it'll probably be approved. But um, even, even Spinraza, this, this kind of wonder drug for spinal muscular atrophy, um, it was licensed by the agencies really quickly. But then there was, a, there was an argument with the, um, pay, uh, the paying agency in the UK Called, which is called NICE, ironically, which made a not very nice decision that they weren't going to cover the cost of the drug. Um, and so that argument took about 18 months, during which time, unfortunately, lots of kids who could have been rescued um, ended up not being able to get the drug. Um, so we hope that, uh, that, the, um, that, you know, we're five years down the line now, and I would hope that if we get really good data from a Huntington drug, the company that owns that drug will know that... Um, it's really bad to have a long argument about the pricing and they'll they'll go in with a pricing point that makes sense. Um, and they certainly, I know for a fact that Rush and, and, and the others will have done their homework because I've been helping them to do that homework in terms of figuring out how much, uh, you know, how much Huntington's disease costs so that we can then give an accurate estimate of how much uh, this drug is likely to uh, need to cost in order to make sense to prescribe. It's worth pointing out too that, um you know, uh, Nusinersen was like the first of this kind of drug chemistry to be approved. In the meantime, it's not just the HV trial that's going on. Um, Ionis, Roche, the other companies that do ASO development, Biogen, have been developing dozens and dozens of ASO therapies for all kinds of brain diseases. Mm -hmm. So, it, it, the you know, the faucet has opened and regulators and drug companies have way more experience with these kinds of drugs now than they did at that time. So hopefully 
hopefully things will go quickly. Um, Archana, the answer to your question, does this drug reverse symptoms or just delay progression is we don't know, but if it works, we expect it to slow progression. Um, and in the process, um, the same drug, if given to someone who's pre manifest, who's got the mutation, but doesn't have symptoms, we expect it to um, delay the onset of the disease. A reversal is a very difficult thing to do. Um, we should, we should, we should pin our hopes on slowing progression or delaying onset, I think. Uh, Jeff, well, why don't let's take this question from Dr. Bonnie. Which current research trials are you both most help, hopeful for? Uh, I mean, I think it's fairly obvious that we're enthusiastic about Huntington lowering. Why don't you talk about other approaches that are exciting at the moment? Yeah, so one of the other like fruits of all of our labor in the sense of like, you know, large studies like the Enroll HD study and other observational studies of HD that take um, like clinical measurements and fluids and DNA samples from lots and lots of HD patients um, have yielded lots of insights into how HD works. Um, and the most exciting of these kind of observational studies to me was what's called a genome-wide association study or a GWAS, which basically looks all the way across a genome at every different little you know, nook and cranny on every chromosome in your body and ask a question, um, are there genes in that region that influence whether someone gets HD earlier or later? Um, and uh, it turns out that there are, and it turns out that a whole bunch of those genes that modulate, that we know already from that kind of data, modulate HD onset, meaning make people have onset earlier or later. Um, those drugs, uh, sorry, those genes are all, or most interestingly, kind of clustered in a, in a, in a category or a pathway of genes um, that have to do with DNA repair, the, right, the natural process by which Every day your DNA is damaged and your cells have these different kinds of machinery around to repair different kinds of DNA damage. And one very specific kind of DNA repair damage, um, the genes required to fix it, turned out to be really, really interesting modulators of HD. So people had variants in those genes and they had HD onset earlier or later than would be normal. And that, that raises the immediate idea that, hey, that's sort of like Ed said earlier, a natural experiment, right? Somebody was just happened to be born with a variant in that gene that made it work a little, be a little better or a little worse, and that happened to influence their HD. So it's cool because we know that if you could mimic that, you could have the same effect. And obviously here we want to delay it, um, but uh, uh, you know that's a genetic, uh, a genetic result, not a not a drug result. So um, as soon as the GWAS was published, a lot of drug companies um, spun up, and so there are a few companies, um, and one I'm particularly excited about because they're they're kind of cruising towards the clinic is one called Triplet. Um, and I'm involved and I've been giving them advice so, to take my advice with a grain of salt, but um, they are interested in interfering uh, with that DNA repair process in a, in a way that based on all that human genetic data is predicted to be productive. Um, and so it's just, it's cool to me because it's like, we always say that science yields like more uh, insights and that will lead to better drug development. It's all kind of theoretical, but it's like literally the guys that started that company, the people that started that company, read the genome-wide association study that all of us HD patient members, uh, community members supported by our samples and went, hey, <laughs> if we could interfere with this specific gene in this specific way, we might be able to have that same effect. And they started a company and like, here we are and they're heading towards human trials. So that whole approach and, and Triplet's just one of the companies that I'm sure will start working in this space uh, is super exciting to me. So Triplet uh, doesn't have a drug yet, but they're starting an op, they, they actually, they might have finished, I'm not sure, a human observational study to start laying the groundwork for their upcoming uh, drug trials. I think that trial is recruited, but not yet quite finished, but it's very close. Um, and, and certainly I know that they that um, the next stage is very much being planned. Um, so yeah, I would agree with, with Jeff's answer there that it's basically, it's while we figure out Huntington lowering, I think the next big thing and, and perhaps something that will run in parallel for years to come is this idea of drugs that stop the HD mutation from getting bigger in your brain while you're alive. Uh, and so that's kind of preventing what we call somatic expansion. Um, oh, someone's asked, uh, Gillian asked, any idea when uh, HD clarity may recommence? Um, actually, HD clarity never stopped. We are, um, we've carried on collecting CSF samples from across the world throughout the pandemic. However, at, at certain individual sites, certainly in the UK and elsewhere, um, there have been times when we've had to, when the sites have had to close down. Um, so as I said earlier, we're basically now in the process of helping those sites to reopen. But for instance, in Germany, 
Um, some sites never stopped collecting CSF uh, and other sites which did have to stop are now up and running again. So the CSF has continued to flow. Um, so my, my advice there would be to, to um, speak to your, your local site about um, what their timelines are. Um, because they they will have the latest information about them um, that specific thing. But in general, clarity clarity will be up and running whenever sites are ready. So Jeff, and, let's, um, let's go ahead. Oh, you, you know, you've, you've... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Abby in the in the Q and A had had a couple really good questions, yeah. um, and in, in particular uh, the the second one. Um, Abby says uh, there have been there have been a lot of misinformation conspiracies surrounding COVID nineteen and the vaccine. Do you ever see massive misinformation about HD and have you ever had to publish any guidance on Buzz to counteract that information? That's a great question. I would say that there are kind of two categories that, of misinformation in the HD community that I worry about generally. And I, I won't embarrass anybody with specific examples. Maybe Ed will. Um, I would say that the one source of misinformation, and this is much better now, but it used to be from drug companies. So when a company would have something that looked like a positive result in a tiny number of HD patients, you know, very like a, something that a statistician or an experienced clinical trial person would be like, yeah, fine, but you have to go do this in like 800 people before you can really believe it. But then it would put out press releases and they would get people hyped up and people would talk about that drug, you know, years after the company had flamed out and never been able to repeat their data. That's one kind of misinformation. Like I said, the, the, the kinds of companies that are involved in HD now, I think are a lot better and the, and the community is a lot more educated. And I think um, hope, luckily, that happens less. And the other, the other super understandable source of misinformation, I think, comes from us in the community ourselves, which is like, um, because of the desperation that people feel, they're so anxious to 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 find anything that works that they really go down a rabbit hole. Um, and so, you know, I've I've talked to HD families that have taken their kids to China to go to stem cell clinics to get injections, and it's 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 100% understandable. Um, but as a scientist, I know how weak the claims by these folks are, or by the sort of alternative therapy people that tell them if they change their diet, they can cure HD. That kind of stuff really bothers me. Um, and, and it's still unfortunately prevalent. And it's, it's like I said, it's totally understandable because it comes from a place of the desperation that we all feel. Um, but that's, that's, that's something that I, I kind of guard against because it makes me, makes me a little furious as a scientist, so. Um, I have a good answer to the second part of the question. Um, I'm sure that uh, you guys can keep a secret. Uh, I'm gonna let you guys in on a secret code that we use for our HD buzz. Uh, look for the articles with a question mark in the headline. Um, if we phrase the if we phrase the uh, article uh, headline as a question mark, it not always, and you can't quote me on this, but it it sometimes means that we are reporting something that's been reported. Um, but uh, the answer to can X cure HD question mark is almost always no. Uh, when we write it in that way. And actually early on, early on, um, we did write quite a few articles because we started HD Buzz because we were both dissatisfied by the quality of information that was available um, and the, the amount of impact that that was having, like Jeff has indicated on people spending a ton of money or putting themselves at risk for things that, that scientists know couldn't work. So we wanted to basically give people a shortcut to the brains of scientists so that we'd be able to just, you know, give people a much clearer steer and also help them to kind of protect themselves against misinformation. Um, so yeah, early on, we, we spent quite a bit of time debunking that stuff. Um, I think there's a lot less of it around now. Uh, but the community's actually done a great job of debunking quite a lot of stuff, not necessarily debunking, but saying, all right, well, you know, you have this idea, let's actually test it. For instance, this, there was a drug called minocycline, which is an antibiotic. Um, and this also touches on someone's question about autophagy. So it's a bit, basically minocycline was a drug that was supposed to increase the garbage removal mechanisms in our cells, one of which is called autophagy or autophagy. And um, so uh, there was enough sort of, speculation from mouse studies that this drug called minocycline might actually help the brains of HD people. Um, and in parallel almost, um, the motor neuron disease ALS community also ran a trial of minocycline. In fact, minocycline was so popular in brain diseases that the HD trial was called Domino, which, stood, which basically stood for do mino, as in fine, we'll do mino, we'll see how, it, how we get on with minocycline. And then anyway, so the HD trial was negative. Um, not 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 helpful not harmful uh, unfortunately the the um als trial showed that minocycline was actually harmful and actually it, there was an uh, earlier 
death and disability and the people who took it. So, so that's why that's why it's really important to you know to not not necessarily test everything. We should test the things with the best chance of success. Um, because if if the science before we get to people tells us that it's not worth trying something or that there's a good chance that harm will be caused, uh, uh, you know, and, and a small chance of benefit, then those are things we should probably steer clear of. Um, you're right about COVID vaccines, though, um, and just specific to HD, there's no evidence uh, or reason to believe that any COVID vaccine will impair fertility or would be harmful to a developing embryo. In fact, the, the thing that's harmful to pregnant women and embryos is COVID, the disease. Um, there's even though the, the vaccine is made from RNA or some of the vaccines are, are a viral gene therapy product, um, there's no reason to believe any of them would interact with the HD gene or with the Huntington protein in anything like a harmful way. And once again, the thing that's harmful to HD patients or people from HD families is the disease, COVID, caused by coronavirus. So my, our, my strong recommendation as a doctor is uh, the, vac the vaccine is strongly recommended for anyone with or at risk of Huntington's disease, because by far the bigger risk in this situation, and by millions of times the bigger risk, is the disease COVID-19. Jeff, do you want to talk a bit more about autophagy? Uh, sorry, no, um, <laughs> not no, sorry. I don't know how to turn off my mute is what that really meant. Um, yeah, so autophagy is, 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 is it, it's a really interesting process um, that's been highlighted by lots of really, really pivotal work um, by lots of people in the HD field. Um, and so it's a, it's a process of cellular kind of um, garbage disposal um, and so clearly on the one hand, like obviously if the Huntington protein is this mutant protein that builds up in cells, cranking up that, that process seems like it would be beneficial. But it's even more interesting than that in HD because some really great work has shown that the Huntington protein itself, this kind of mysterious protein that we don't understand very well, might itself be involved in regulating this autophagy process, this sort of cellular recycling system. So it seems like one of the jobs of Huntington might be to help cells turn over their 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 not just the Huntington protein, but all of the kind of damage stuff that happens to a cell every day. Um, and so there's conceptually, there's a lot of reasons to go after it. I will say that there's no, in, in those genome-wide association studies where we looked for variants um, that changed when people had onset of HD, there wasn't a lot of autophagy genes that jumped out of there and there, there could have been. Um, you know, and similarly, there's other processes that have been implicated by good lab science that, that haven't been supported by human genetic data yet. But we, you know, we keep, we keep doing those studies. I, I think there's about to be another study of another genome-wide association study with 9,000 people in it or something. So we'll keep looking, we'll keep hunting. There's, there's smart people looking at autophagy and HD, um, trying to understand its dysregulation and, and try to find compounds to, 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 to enhance it. Um, uh, Abby's other question was about um, seeing how quickly the COVID vaccines were were uh, developed and licensed. Is there anything that people can do to accelerate the approval of HD therapeutics? I think my advice there is, first of all, it's, it's great that you're keen and you should keep your ear to the ground for how the trials are going. Um, but the main the main thing that, that we really need the community to do right now is 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 support the trials themselves, either by volunteering or by helping someone else to volunteer or by taking part in Enroll HD, which is the one big trial that nearly everyone from an HD family can take part in. And that's the best way to make sure that, that the research happens as quickly as possible. If there is a need for HD patients to directly lobby the regulators, you'll hear about it from HD Buzz and from other organizations like HDA, probably HDO and HDSA and so on. But right now they don't have an application on their desk uh, that they're inviting submissions from. So you could, you could write to the FDA and say, hey guys, we want you to license drugs for Huntington's disease really quickly. And they'd be like, what drugs? We haven't had, a, we haven't had an application, so we can't help you. Um, so for now, focus on supporting each other getting vaccinated, surviving the pandemic, and then getting the research back up and running, volunteer from Roll HD, and help, let's help get the next generation of clinical trials fully recruited. Uh, any other questions, Jeff? I'm, I haven't been looking at the chat. Um, I, think we've, I think we may have answered all of the live questions in the Q and, oh no, here we go. Chris has asked, sorry, he asked this a while ago. Well, he or she asked this a while ago. What made you get into HD? Um, Jeff, 
is doing a talk later today, uh, which is yes. about his personal journey. I was a neurologist um, in training and I was looking for a research project to do. And I basically was randomly allocated to doing a Huntington's disease clinic with Sarah Tabrizi. And um, meeting one HD family was enough to get me interested in HD um, and seeing seeing how uh, how much difference you could make if you became someone who is interested in HD, who has the potential to offer physical, practical help as well as uh, getting involved in research. So for me, it was one HD clinic and being mentored by Sarah Tabrizi and then helping to um, establish the research program at UCL um, and then basically just meeting lots of HD family members and uh, researchers. It's, it, there isn't really an HD research community. There's an HD community and it involves patients and researchers and families and everyone else and, and, and is exemplified by my friend and colleague, Dr. Carroll, who may want to comment briefly on his answer to that question. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I took the, 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 the sort of easy road to HD, which was that um, when I found out my mom was sick, uh, I, just, I just wanted to understand what was happening. And it really bothered me that with the limited information I had at, at the time um, that, I, that I, I couldn't wrap my head around what was happening with my mom's illness. Um, and so um, that sparked me to heading back to school and, and, and eventually specializing. And like Ed said, running into Sarah Tabrizi, I, I was really lucky to run into a remarkable trainee or people to train me. So I, I um, did my PhD with a guy called Michael Hayden, who's run an incredible clinic for HD patients in Vancouver, BC for decades um, and just happened to be sort of in the right place at the right time to realize how much impact, um, as Ed said, that, you know, not just research, but, but applied clinical research that actually is trying to help people today while also pushing for a cure. It was just inc incredibly inspiring professionally. So obviously I have this personal motivation my personal connection, but um, meeting the right people at the right time in my professional development to show me that you could make a big impact even in the absence of a cure today uh, was really meaningful for me. Cool. Mustafa, yeah. what do you reckon? We should pro yeah, there's probably a good, a good, good point to, to go. wrap Yeah, up. so we yeah. still have a couple of minutes left. So I just wanna highlight a quote you said, Dr. Wild, I think it was five, six years ago ago now that the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago and the second best time was is now and in a sense we're seeing the fruits of that labor that you guys underwent now coming to fruition and exactly really, yeah i'll take it one step further though if you want a professional career growing trees you have to plant trees every year and and you plant and you harvest every year as soon uh, and you so you must never even though you may be harvesting you must remember to keep planting. Yep. So yes, exactly. right. Hopefully we will see fruits from the trees we planted a while ago, but my goodness me, we're also planting lots of very exciting trees. Yeah, yeah. thanks for and reminding also, me of that. I love always, it when people quote me to myself. Yeah, <laughs> Science <laughs> is a process. <laughs> so, you know, eventually it's like increments and eventually I think we'll get there. Bingo, yeah. so, science is cumulative. Agreed. Yeah, thank you so much, both of you, Professor Wild and Dr. Carroll. Associate oh, yeah. Professor Carroll. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mustafa. Ignore yeah. the small angry man in England. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Uh, hopefully next time we, meet, we can it can be in person. We can hopefully, be in the same hopefully. Fingers crossed. continent. <laughs> All right. Um, Stay safe. Get back to everybody. Take care. Yeah. Bye, guys. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye. Just a word on the next session. So on track one, we have um, Mariana, who will be presenting on her experiences with PGD and how to have children. And on track two, we have, I think, let me double check. Uh, yeah, BJ, who was a former chair of HGYO and he's gonna be talking about how he helped Matt set up HGYO and chaired it for a while. All right, thank you so much, everyone. And I'll see you over the next two days, one day. And we'll hopefully have great sessions again.